update on promise pipelining. Uh, this is an update about a pair, pair of proposals, both of which were presented last time. Uh, the eventual send proposal, which is the underlying API and semantics for supporting uh, promise pipelining, for supporting the ability to do efficient distributed object programming, efficient and pleasant distributed object programming, um, uh, and the separate wavy dot uh, syntax proposal um, uh, for providing syntactic support for doing that kind of programming. And this is an update on both of those, but we should remember that they are two separate proposals. What we proposed last time was uh, that the eventual operations were these five operations, an eventual get, uh, an eventual uh, set, an eventual property assignment, an eventual property delete, an eventual apply function, and an eventual apply method. Um, and uh, we came up with this set by starting with the, with the set that we found to be useful in practice that we, that we ourselves used, and then generalizing according to sort of what the, na the natural operations were on property access in JavaScript. However, having added the, having expanded the set of operations to these five, which we thought was sort of a natural general, generalization, uh, Salah Motal on the uh, SES calls uh, identified um, a, what we call the chained assignment anomaly, uh, which is when you see an expression like that and you just think of um, a wavy dot as adjective dot in the same way the question mark dot is thought of as adjective dot for a different adjective and you're just reasoning about it like a property access, a JavaScript programmer looking at this expression would naturally expect that um, uh, q tilde dot bar and p tilde dot foo uh, would eventually have the same value. However, when you take a look at what these things uh, uh, expand into, what, what, what code they're equivalent to, the right-hand side assignment, uh, p tilde dot foo equals 8, uh, uh, expands into the first form, is equivalent to the first form, which is doing essentially a then on the, p, oh, sorry, equivalent to it in the local case. I'm just going to talk about the local case for explaining the, the assignment anomaly um, uh, because we even have the anomaly in the local case. You don't have to go to distributed programming to have the anomaly. Um, that if P uh, fulfills to a local object called T1, then P tell dot foo equals eight is eventually assigning to P's fulfillment uh, assigning to its foo property the value 8. The problem is that this expression as a whole, the value of that, which is sh uh, reified in the code here in the rewrite as t2, uh, that value is immediately a promise for what the value of the assignment will be. In other words, it's, Im it's immediately a promise that will eventually be fulfilled with 8. And then the outer assignment um, uh, does the same kind of eventual assignment to Q's fulfillment, which is T3, assigning to its bar property uh, the value of T2, which is a promise. So uh, the result is that there is a violation of programmer expectation, um, uh, which you can understand in terms of the rewrite, or to put it in terms uh, in which the programmer using the eventual send operators directly would be thinking when they're not thinking about the rewrite, they have this expectation, uh, p, but, but p tilde dot foo is eventually eight, uh, whereas q tilde dot bar is eventually set to a promise for eight. So in the call, we started um, talking about all sorts of ways to repair this. And we realized, wait a second, we're, we're, we're now thinking about complexity to solve a problem that's an unnecessary problem that we created for a symmetry we did not need, which is that of these five, of these five operations, 
We've only ever found three of them to be useful. We, in fact, would only recommend that anybody use three of them. Uh, and the problem comes up with the other two. So the other two are the eventual assignment and the eventual delete. And a way to think about this is without those, then all you've got to the remote object is the ability to query it or the ability to ask it to do something. And then any state updates it does are according to the semantics of its API rather than, than expressing side effects to its state remotely. Why don't you pick three? I'm sorry? You pick three, three right here. Yeah. So, so the till dot, the p till dot foo, the um, uh, p till dot, the apply, basically the eventual get, the eventual apply function, the eventual apply method is the three that we're keeping. No, you hit three. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You are correct. I was misreading the slide because one of them doesn't have syntax. So we also added a has operation. So there's eventual has, eventual set, and eventual delete. Uh, eventual has is, is still query only, so one could imagine keeping it, but it's really not tremendously useful. Um, uh, and what we're actually using in practice is really just these three. It's the only thing that we've ever used in practice going back um, uh, to the late 90s, uh, in fact, with the earlier versions of this kind of distributed promise computation. So uh, what we're now proposing is to simply get rid of those. We've already updated the proposal and updated the shim to get rid of the operations. Uh, but um, now that we've reduced it to the three, we can also have enough room to show the full picture, which is uh, we also have another three, which are the send only variants of those three. Um, uh, and syntactically, when the expression, the tilde dot expression appears in a syntactic con context like a um, uh, like the top expression of an expression statement where the value that it returns, the promise that this would return is obviously ignored when mapping this into a distributed protocol. It's useful to know that because there's a ton of extra bookkeeping it enables you to avoid if you know that the promise that uh, to the remote result will be ignored. So. Um, so we have the send-only versions, um, and those correspond to these default behaviors. Um, uh, uh, the, void the unary void operator in JavaScript, for those who don't know, um, is one that uh, uh, throws away the, the value of its operand, evaluates the, the operand expression, throws away the value, and the void expression as a whole just evaluates to undefined. Uh, and frankly, uh, even this one is very suspect. Um, uh, so I colored this pink rather than wiping it out with red, but, but going forward, we should be suspicious that uh, any time you see this, it's probably a mistake because uh, to do a property get only for effect is unlikely to be what the programmer expected. Our proposal right now is to keep this in the, in the proposal and in this case, use tooling to warn the programmer that they might have made a mistake. Um, okay. Uh, in the in the remainder of this update, I want to emphasize the symmetry between the way we're thinking of handled promises and the philosophy that we pursued in creating proxies, because it turns out that they're extremely parallel. So right now in the language, we have a new proxy API in which, in which a proxy creates something that acts like an object, but the handler is the extension point for reflectively turning object operations into traps on the handler. We also have a promise API for creating a fresh unhandled promise. Uh, and that's very good for the built-in promises, but doesn't give us an extension point for, that we need for doing the promise pipelining. So the, the, um, uh, the updated handled promise um, uh, API is as follows, uh, which is uh, in the same way that the promise takes an argument function 
which is called back providing a resolve and a reject function for, re for resolving the return promise. Um, over here, the handle promise uh, uh, takes in a function to be called back, but also takes in, at the bottom here, this additional optional argument, which is the unfulfilled handler, that will handle these operations on an, un on an, on an unresolved handled promise. Uh, and the arguments to the callback function, we add an additional optional argument, which is resolve with presence. If the, if the handle promise is resolved with either resolve or reject, then, then from that point forward, it's just a normal resolve promise. Uh, no further uh, handling, um, no further remote uh, behavior, because it's now just resolved to a local promise. Uh, resolve with presence. Um, Resolve with presence, you provide a presence handler, which is the thing that, 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 enable, that says this promise is now fulfilled to a remote object, uh, but now I still need a handler so that, me, so that eventual operations on the local promise can still be serialized and sent to the, remote, to the remote object. You need to know that it's resolved because a dot then on a handled promise, while it's unresolved, the dot then doesn't fire. When the pr handle promise gets resolved to a remote object, the dot then fires. But that leaves us with an interesting puzzle, which is, I say, I need to plug in. Sorry. But the, the dot then call on a remote promise that has been fulfilled with a remote object gives us an interesting puzzle, which is um, the, 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 the success callback of the dot then has to be called with some non-venable uh, that represents what the promise was fulfilled with. But what the promise was actually fulfilled with is elsewhere on the network. So you can't provide the local success callback with that object. So we introduced this concept of a presence. Uh, this goes back to uh, Chip's uh, Unum model from the 90s. Um, and the presence is basically just a local object that's the local representative of the actual remote object. But it gives you the thing as the callback. Uh, and then the uh, tell dot applied to the presence uh, is equivalent to the tell dot applied to the promise for the presence. So when we specified proxies, it turns out that there's a shocking number of elements to introducing proxies into the language uh, that you have to get right and you have to make coherent with each other. All of the rows on this table were elements of introducing proxies to the language correctly. And we got this right. And we find that this is a guiding parallel for understanding all of the elements of handled promises. So first of all, we refactored the internal methods in the spec that apply to all objects so that the, those internal methods were observationally equivalent to what they had been in ES5, but they were refactored so that they could now be safely virtualizable by handlers. Um, in, li in like manner, the handle promises uh, is proposing to add exactly these internal methods to all promises. We added static methods um, uh, to bring out the, to the JavaScript API the ability to invoke those internal methods on any object. Um, and likewise, our handled promise class brings out exactly these static methods to do likewise for the uh, new promise internal methods. Uh, for each of these um, uh, uh, internal methods on objects, we gave it a default behavior, what, what it does on a normal non-exotic object. And likewise, for each of these internal methods that we're adding to, to all promises, we're giving it a standard uh, default behavior, which is it just turns into the corresponding uh, eventual property access. Uh, so even if you're not concerned with remote, it gives you a nice, pleasant way to do all these remote uh, op all these eventual operations 
uh, on, the on the fulfillment of promises you've got. Um, uh, for um, when you do these operations on a proxy, it turns into a trap on the handler. Right likewise, when you do it on a handle promise, it turns into a trap on the handler. This is the complete, the, there's many traps on proxies. These are exactly the traps on handled promises. Uh, this is uh, the key thing, which is there's a set of invariants that we define as universal to all objects, the object invariants in the spec. Um, and we write down those invariants, and uh, we guarantee that um, uh, those invariants hold for proxies as well. And likewise, we want a set of invariants for these new operations and invariants across all promises. Uh, and the, the key invariant, the key new invariant, is that all of these eventual operations protect the caller from reentrancy attacks. That if you that for any of these um, eventual operations, uh, a code that expresses such an operation, the operands of the operation cannot cause code of their choosing to run during the evaluation of that expression or even during the turn from which the expression was, out, was, was evaluated. That everything that is caused by the operands of the eventual operator uh, are all postponed to a later turn and potentially post, you know, also um, uh, something remote. Um, and then, uh, besides writing down the invariants, since the handlers of proxies are untrusted, we have to introduce um, uh, mechanisms to enforce that a malicious handler can still not create a proxy that violates the invariants. Similarly, we do that with the relationship between a handled promise and its handler, uh, in particular uh, postponing the invocation of the handler trap until a later turn. Um, uh, and finally, uh, rather than forcing everybody using a proxy to write all of the handlers manually, uh, they can omit some of the high-level handlers, and if they omit a high-level handler, it defaults to behavior in terms of a low-level handler. So for example, if a handler implements get on property descriptor and does not implement get, then the proxy mechanism provides a get defined in terms of the get on property. It basically delegates low-level behavior to get on property uh, so that you can just override get on property and you get a consistent get behavior simply as a consequence. Likewise, for all the send onlys, if they're omitted from the handler, they just cause the corresponding send trap, uh, throwing away the result and returning undefined. Um, and the eventual method send, could you can actually omit that from the handler, and it's the equivalent of an eventual property get, which returns a promise for a remote function, followed by an eventual invocation on the promise of the remote function to eventually invoke the remote function. Uh, uh, in the case of a distributed protocol, the, one, the form on the right is substantially more expensive, um, which, but, uh, but it's semantics preserving, so it's nice to have that as a fallback. Um, uh, and finally, uh, um, we are all, including myself, very uncomfortable with proposing new syntax. So what we've not only explored, but actually implemented and providing in production uh, is a proxy-based shorthand that corresponds to the different syntactic shorthands. Um, uh, but we found we, that um, the path of least resistance was basically to introduce three new, pro three new kinds of proxy. Um, uh, you need at least two. You cannot do it with one new kind of proxy. Um, because, um, so this is the event. So we, you know, basically we have this E that's importable from our shim. And then e.g is for an eventual getter that you just say dot get dot foo. It does the eventual get of foo, returns to you a promise for the result. F is eventual function call. And then e by itself, we use the short form here because it's by far the most common operation in doing distributed object programming, uh, does the distributed method call. But even that still leaves aside 
the only operation. So for each of these, uh, if you uh, do a dot send only and then do the rest of it, then it does the send only variant, throwing away the result and avoiding the internal bookkeeping by expanding to these internal methods, I mean, these uh, static methods. Um, and I want to use the slide to emphasize that the important difference between the right column and the left column is not brevity. It's not that we're continuing to hope for the syntax because it's smaller. We're continuing to hope for the syntax because it's much easier to remember and understand um, that, uh, that we leave it up to the rewriter to look at the expression and figure out which of these things it is and also to look at the context of the expression and, and figure out whether the send only variant is called for. And, okay, um, can I take two questions? How many questions do we have on the queue? We have one question. One question on the queue. Oh, now two questions. Okay. Uh, I guess one my first. Okay, let me let me turn off the um, let me turn off the uh, recording very, first. Very